Reading from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Welcome here. My name is, is Jeff, one of the leaders here at Grace Evergreen. And again, what a privilege it is to, to open up scripture and to, to see Jesus. Uh, like for me to, to, to preach Jesus when you know, we get the chance. Like what a privilege it is. You know, even when we gather together to be able to, to, to sing unto him. Like man, what a, it's awesome. So I love the opportunity to when we're together each week just to make much of Jesus. So uh, if you have guessed it already, uh, the past few weeks we're, we're in the book of Hebrews uh, looking at this letter, uh, kind of written like a, uh, a sermon written to the people uh, just to encourage them. These, these people that it was written to were, were struggling with their faith. They, they were wavering. They were, you know, wanting to go back to, to how things were. It was, it was tough. They were, they were feeling pressure all around them and they were just like man we're 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 done we're gonna tap out this is it was way easier if we go out we go back you know it was back we had it we had it good back then so they wanted to go back and the author of this book is just like guys just keep your eyes on jesus just focus on him keep going you can do it just keep striving for it and that is that is this message that he has and these people that that wanted to go back to to judaism this way of doing things the author we've seen so far is he's reminding them that, that Jesus is better, that, that Jesus is, is better than, than angels. He's, he's better than Moses. He's better than, than Joshua. And, and today we're going to see uh, the message for us is that he, he's, he's the better high priest. And this, this message is, is, is for us too, because there's a tendency we're going to see to, to look to other things. To, and that's, that's going to be the question we're going to maybe have you answer in your, in your hearts today, what are you looking to? And so uh, the author is reminding people that we have Jesus to look to. So I'm glad you guys are here in the book of Hebrews chapter five, and we're gonna, we're gonna dive in to see what the, the spirit has to say for us. So I'm gonna, just gonna pray. I wanna pray that, that our eyes and that our ears would be open to what the spirit has to teach us this afternoon. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you are here and that uh, um, we want to hear from you. We, we want to grow in our, in our love for you. And, and so I just pray that you would teach us this afternoon, that you would open our hearts, you would stir our, our affections, that you would open our eyes. Jesus, we want to see you. Let us just grow and, and know you more. And if we're here this afternoon and we, we don't know you well, I, I just pray that we would, we would know more of you, even just a little bit more. We would come to know who you are and what you have done for us. So. Heavenly Father, just speak to us today. Amen. So first, let's, let's dive into this, this chapter, chapter 5, we have ourselves. So let's look at the first four verses. They're kind of the first chunk that we're going we're gonna to dive into. So look what it says in the first five verses. It says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts, and sacrifices for sins, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins, just as he does for, for those of the people. 
but no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So what this verse does, this, this first few verses, it really sets up and it shows us the responsibilities that a priest had, the high priest had. So the high priest was a man, it says, that was appointed from God. So God appoints these, these, these individuals, these men, and the job of the high priest is to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. So they would do this by once a year, they would go into this room in the temple. The, the temple had this inner room called the Holy of Holies. So this middle place, and then the priest would, would go in there once a year with, with, with blood. And he would take this blood that, that, sent, that, that was a symbol of this payment for sin. And he would pour it over something called the Ark of the Covenant, which was in this most holy room. And he would pour it over the middle part called the mercy seat. And blood would pour down over top of the seat. And that would be a symbol of, of, uh, of their sin offering over top of this. And then he would, he, would, he would leave. And so he would go into this and do this once a year. Now, if you don't, aren't familiar with what the Ark of the Covenant is, um, you can look it up. There are lots of references we see in the Old Testament to this, this Ark. And there were things that were put in it, but it symbolized God's presence. And so the, the Holy of Holies was where this Ark of the Covenant was. And the high priest would go in there and, and offer this blood offering as an atonement for their sins. And he would do that once a year. Now, something that the high priest did, and what this really was, and we can see that, that now because we see the whole picture of what Jesus has done, is it really did a good job of painting a picture so we could understand what Jesus did. What Jesus did on the cross with his, with his death and with his, his resurrection. And so we get the idea here, and there's a word that, that was used a, a few weeks back called propitiation. And, and Sam talked about this a few weeks ago. And it's the idea here that, that, that blood can cover over our mistakes. That although we're guilty and, and we deserve, because of our sin, we deserve death and destruction, that there could be innocent blood. And the priest would take blood from a, a, a lamb and an animal, an innocent la- animal, and that would serve as the atonement for the sins of the people. And so it paints this picture of Jesus being perfect, Dying for us, though we deserve death and destruction, Jesus would do this. So this is a picture that points us to Jesus. So in verse 1, we see that the job of the priest was to go into the Holy of Holies and do this. This is what they had to do, and they were appointed from God. And I like the word appointed. It, it's mentioned, and it says that this is, they were, were appointed from it. This wasn't a, a, a job that they were, there wasn't an election. I know we're likely having a provincial election coming up. It's going to be called in the next couple of weeks. Um, we just came out of an election season. Um, this wasn't a, a vote. You didn't, didn't vote for who you thought would be the, you know, there wasn't Israel's next great high priest kind of competition where people would come in and they would do their thing and they would choose who was going to be the best high priest. Um, it wasn't like that. It wasn't a job that they would apply for and go through an, an interview process. Uh, they, they, they didn't do that either. They were appointed. God would choose who he wanted for his high priest. He picked them and set them in this position. This is one of the defining marks of of Judaism, that the nation of Israel could trace back all the way back to, to Aaron, who was the first high priest, this succession of high priests that were appointed by God from men, um, all the way back. And this is, so they were, they were appointed. And the, the, the God chose them for this task. And the nation of Israel would have seen the high priest. They would have really seen it uh, as an appointment, as this demonstration of God's presence among them. That's how they would have seen it. And what we can see from this verse is that, is that the purpose for God appointing high priests, uh, so then as a, as a representative... So these high priests, in fact, they were, they were a representative of, of the people of Israel. They were the, a representative of the people of nation, chosen from the people. That's why they had to be from the people. So they would go into this most holy place before God, perform sacrifices, uh, offer gifts, do these kind of priestly duties on behalf of the people in their, their place. So they, in fact, they were a representative of the people of God. What we see in verse 2 is that it actually gives us a bit more of a description of the things that they had to do. 
Not only did high priests have to deal with people, I'm sure they would have had to deal with, with people coming in and out and offering gifts and sacrifices for them, but they had to deal with difficult people. And I'm not sure how many of you have work a job or have to deal with difficult people from time to time. But the high priest had to deal with difficult people. And it says that they had to not just deal with kind of difficult people, but had to deal with difficult people gently. You had to be gentle in the way they dealt with them. It's, notice what it says. It says they had to deal gently with, with the ignorant and the wayward. Now, ignorant people aren't always the, the easiest to deal with. I, in, in my job, um, I, I get phone calls and, and people that stop in, in my office, and I often get like ignorant, that's a good word for it, ignorant people that call and make comments. And I, I can't, I wish I could say that I deal gently with them. I often I don't. But the high priest, his job was to deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward people. So what does it mean by ignorant and wayward? Ignorant in this verse uh, is likely meaning people were just ignorant of their knowledge of God, which, which is odd because the, the people of Israel of the day, they, they would have known all about God. They, they grow up and they're not, they're, they're familiar with the covenant. They're familiar with, with the laws and all the requirements. And so we, we, we can see in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, like they, they, their children knew the law. They were told to meditate it on a day and night. They were told to write it on their hearts. They, they had these, these festivals and celebrations where they were reminded about what God did, where, where, where scripture was read out loud in public. So all of these things. And so for someone to be ignorant about God and what he has done, that means they were deliberate. They were deliberately disobeying and disregarding, forsaking everything that God wanted. Forsaking everything and walking away from it. So these ignorant people, that though they heard all about the law, they heard all about God around them, they chose to say, you know what, I, I don't want to listen to this. I, I, forget it. The high priests had to deal gently with these people. The other type it says is the wayward. Now to me, wayward is, is someone who is not following God. Now the Israelites, like we said, would have had knowledge about God and following the laws, but you know, not everybody would have believed it. Not everybody would have wanted to follow it. So they would have gone and done their own thing. They would have rejected God. These people are wayward. It doesn't mean necessarily outright rebellion, but it's people who just are wayward in their thoughts wayward in their, in their habits and the things that they are doing. And they're wandering from God. Think of a, a picture of a wayward ship that's just floating far away. It's wayward. It's not following the path it should. So we see from verse 2 that I find interesting because the high priest needs to deal with these. He's got to deal gently with them. And my, my first reaction wouldn't always be to be gentle. High priest was called to be gentle with them. But he can identify with them. It says he identifies with their ignorance and their waywardness because he too, it says, is a human. Do you see what it says? He's beset with weakness as they are. He, he too has these struggles. He is not perfect. So he can deal compassionately and he can deal gently with the wayward and the sinful because he understands it because he too is beset with weakness. This was the high priest. So if we look at verse 3, we can see there's a, a commonality between the high priest and the people as they both have sins that, that need to be atoned for. So just as the other people were beset with sin, the high priest also we see is beset with sin. He's got these weaknesses, but before he could offer up sacrifices for the people, he was obligated, it says, to offer atonement for his own sin. And because of this, he had to offer atonement. So it's interesting that he had to do that before. He couldn't just be lumped in and said, okay, I'm going to do this. This is going to be for everybody, including myself. But he had to do that before he could go in to the most holy place, this holy of holies that had to be done before he could enter it. Before he could go into God's, God's presence and intercede on their behalf, he had to purify himself through sacrifice. 
This is, these are the acts of the high priest, what they had to do. And then we see in verse 4, it just reiterates that this was not a volunteer position. They don't take up the position to have a position of honor. They don't do this for their, for their own glory, for their own uh, prestige. They only assume it because they are called by God, appointed by God to do it. Again, they're not elected by the people, for the people. But God calls them to be a high priest. See, God's calling here, it emphasizes that the nature, the nature of this, this priestly role. There was an office motivated and marked by service to others and humility. That's really what it was. So that's the first four verses in it. And it lays out and it shows us the role of the high priest. What, what they were supposed to do. They offered sacrifices. They were appointed. They atoned for their own sin before they went into the temple. So that's what it tells us. We get this idea of a high priest. Now next, the next few verses, now, now we got to see Jesus. And the author does a really good job of, of comparing Jesus as this high priest, as a better high priest, to the high priest. And so we're going to see Jesus now in comparison to this priestly role. We've seen the roles of the high priest. Now we're going to see Jesus. And I think it's going to be clear that Jesus is not only a, a better high priest, not just better, but he's the best. It's the only high priest that we will need. So let's look at the next two verses. We'll do the next two and see what they say. Verse five, it says, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as he says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what we see here is Jesus also was appointed. Jesus was, was sent out, was commissioned, was given that calling and appointed from his heavenly father. Jesus, like all other high priests in this appointment, was appointed appointed to this role. He did not exalt himself to be a high priest. He didn't do it to, to seek his own glory. This wasn't for his own prestige like we see other high priests, but he was appointed to this. This passage tells us that the heavenly father, his heavenly father appointed the son and the son obediently accepted this role. Then again, so we see that this appointment from Jesus, he was appointed. Then it, it lists some scripture references. And the author of Hebrews has done this a bunch of times now. And I love that he does this. But he uses the Old Testament to continue to point us to Jesus. He uses all these Old Testament passages to keep showing us that this is pointing to Jesus. Now the author does this over and over. And I think the author or the audience reading this would have been familiar with these passages and how they were in their original context. And now they're seeing it in a new way as it's pointing to Jesus. And it's encouraging them to keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't go back, but look to Jesus. So the first passage that it quotes is Psalm chapter two, verse seven. That's that you are my son today. I've begotten you. And the second one, the second reference is in Psalm 110, verse four to show that Jesus was appointed by his heavenly father as a priest forever. In that second passage, it, it mentions somebody by name. It mentions the name Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? And why, why would he be referenced in this? See, Melchizedek was a priest, was a high priest uh, in the New Testament. In fact, he's actually only mentioned in two different passages. There's two, two different places where, where Melchizedek is, is mentioned. Uh, the first one is Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 to 20. And the next one is, is this passage where it references here in, in Psalm 110. So you can see on the screen, I think hopefully it's up there, Genesis chapter 14. Is, this is the first mention of Melchizedek. So when it mentions that, 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 that Jesus... As a, as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So who is this Melchizedek? Well, what does it say? We can see in this passage that he was a king. Melchizedek was a king and he was the king of, of Sodom. But what he does is he does something odd. It's something that, that kings don't normally do. And he comes and he meets up with Abraham. Abraham, I guess at the time. And he gives him bread and wine. 
not really a kingly kind of task, but, but, task, but he does this anyway. Then it also mentions that he is a priest of God most high. He's a king and he's a priest of God most high. It's interesting. This, this is way before Aaron. Aaron is regarded as the first high priest. Melchizedek is coming. This is happening before Aaron is around. And what's interesting as well is Melchizedek isn't an Israeli. He's, he's not an Israelite. He's a, he's a foreigner. And here he is acting as a priest of God. And he's bringing, bringing gifts to Abraham. And Melchizedek blesses Abraham. And Abraham responds by giving him a tenth of everything that he has. And then he disappears. And we don't hear anything about Melchizedek narratively wise. And he's mentioned again until Psalm 110, where it mentions that again, and we see that reference at all. That's all that we hear from him. And I don't want to spend a ton of time on Melchizedek, because actually, to, to give something away, we're going to talk about him in chapter 7. So if you've read the book of Hebrews, he's going to come up again, and there's going to be a whole chapter where we talk again on Melchizedek. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about him today, but the important thing to, need, to know about this, what we need to know is that Melchizedek symbols, symbolizes in the, an Old Testament priesthood way different from the priesthood of, of Aaron and from the tribe of Levi. Melchizedek becomes a, a, a symbol, like the symbol that points us to, to Jesus, to his priesthood that has no beginning and no ending. It's a priesthood that, that lasts forever. And we see that in chapter 5, verse 6. It's something that lasts forever. And the symbolism of, the, of this uh, is that Melchizedek symbolized that and Jesus realized it. So Jesus became that. So Christ is a high priest and he has, will be this for eternity, will be this forever. See, other high priests, if you're a high priest, eventually it's going to end because you're going to die. But Jesus, because of his resurrection from the grave, his resurrection from the dead, he serves as a priest forever. And that's, that's really what it's getting at here. It's a priestly, priestlyhood that will last forever. There will be no end. But again, what we're going to look at Melchizedek in the next couple of weeks when we get to chapter 7. So let's, let's move on and see what it, it says. The next three verses, verses, or four verses, 7 to 10, this is what they say. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. In being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Okay. So this is really now where we get to start to see Jesus uh, and how he is uh, the better high priest. See, in verse 7, we see that, that Jesus cries out. So he offers prayers and supplications and loud cries and, and, and tears. We have Jesus, he's praying and he's begging for it. He's crying out and he's weeping for this. And he's crying out to his heavenly father. But what was he calling out for? What's Jesus calling out for? The passage says that he was asking God to save him. Now, if you grew up in the church and you maybe are a bit familiar with scripture, you're going to think, well, this is what he means. This, this is in reference to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is just before his death, and he's, and he's praying, and he's pleading with God to take this cup from him. But I, I, I think maybe that's part of it, but I don't think that's the, the whole picture we have here, because the beginning of verse 7, it says that Jesus, Jesus prayed this in the days of his flesh. This is something Jesus prayed all the time. It wasn't a brief one-time thing. This is a lifetime of prayer calling out and pleading with God. It showed us that Jesus was dependent on God. He was pleading, asking to, be, to have his needs met to sustain him. Jesus, like all their humans, who was a human being in this regard, he had to pray to his heavenly father for help, calling out to him. It says his prayers were to the one who was able to save him from death. See, they were not prayers 
looking for, uh, to escape the, the cross. He wasn't praying to get out of that, to, to escape the cross or the grave. In fact, Jesus predicted his death. He, he knew that he was going to die. John chapter 12, verse 27, we, we see that. He, he understands that throughout the Gospels. It said that there's the purpose why he came. The reason he was sent into the world was for that. So Jesus knew that. So I don't think he's praying to be saved from the death. That's not the death he's talking about. And the one who was able to save Jesus from death answered his prayer and delivered him from his death through the resurrection. He saved him from death through the resurrection. Father wasn't deaf to his calls, to his tears of his son. In fact, it says that he heard his son's prayers. What does it say? If you look at what it says, what does it say? Why did he hear his son's prayers? It says, because of his reverence. He heard because of his reverence. See, reverence is, this, is, a, is, a, is a big word, but it really means there's awe. Because of his awe, because of his, his devotion, because of his submission to the Father. The Father heard the Son because he feared God and because he totally submitted himself to the Father's will. Because of this reverence, he submitted himself in, in obedience to his heavenly Father. So God heard his cries. Look at verse 8. It says, even though he was a son, and we know that he was the son of God, he had to learn obedience. He didn't just come automatically as God's son. He wasn't just given obedience. He had a full measure of obedience. It says that he learned obedience through what? He suffered. See, Jesus as a man had to learn this. It means he moved from being untested to being tested and proven. And he he learned obedience, it says, through suffering. Through through unspeakable suffering, Jesus learned obedience. And what was his reward for all this obedience? What what does it say about Jesus because of all this obedience? The first few words of chapter 9 tell us that. It tells us that he was made perfect. And being made perfect. This perfection is not just because he was the son of God. He wasn't just perfect because of that. He was perfect because of his endurance and suffering. Because of his obedience in suffering. Suffering taught Jesus how to submit to his father's will. This is, gets good now. Look, if we look back. At verses 2 and 3, we, we see the high priest had to offer sacrifices for his sins, for his own sins. It says because they were, they were be, he was beset with weakness. But here we see that Jesus, though he suffered, he, he was perfect. And it was because of this perfection, it says that he became the source of salvation. To all who believe. See, Jesus' perfect suffering is the basis for our salvation. Don't miss this. That Jesus is the source of our salvation. We have one priest, a high priest, (coughs) who had to offer sacrifices for his own sins. That's the high priest. And we have, have Jesus who was perfect through his obedience, who didn't have to atone for his own sins before before he went into the Holy of Holies, before he would be in God's presence because he was perfect. And he obtained salvation for us. He's the source of salvation. Let's not miss this because I think even we have a tendency to look for other things to save us. We saw that video at the beginning. When we looked at this video, we're looking to other things sometimes, aren't we? Our hearts wander. What are you looking for to save you? Are you looking for other things sometimes? Does your heart wander? Do you think that maybe if you're good enough, you'll be saved? See in this passage, 
the source of our salvation isn't in what we do. We are not the source of salvation. Jesus is. Jesus did not have to offer sacrifices for his sins. The priest did. Jesus didn't have to because he was perfect. We are saved because of that, because he was perfect. He is literally the perfect high priest. However, it's interesting. It says the salvation isn't given to all. You might wrestle with that for a bit. This might be a hard passage to think, well, didn't, didn't Jesus die for everyone? What does the passage say? Obtained salvation for everybody that would obey him. He uses the word obey. See, obedience is something that, that, that we do. But we, we do it because of our love for him. Because of what, what he did for us. And this points us to Jesus. Remember, he said, because Jesus learned obedience. There's that obey word. He learned obedience through suffering. Because of this obedience that he had through suffering, we are saved. Everyone who obeys him. See, this is a theme of the book of Hebrews that we see to, that he's encouraging the people to keep obeying, to keep their eyes on Jesus, to keep, don't abandon your faith. And there's a call for obedience. See, obedience is a response to what God has done for us. Obedience is a response to what God has done for us. It doesn't work the other way around. We don't obey at the front end to get something. It's not why we obey. We obey because we already have it. Obedience is a response to what Jesus has done for us. We see at the end, verse 10, it concludes by talking about this priesthood of Jesus and returning to this reality that that God designated Jesus as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. This order that lasts forever. The assurance of our faith is that Christ is a priest forever. Something that won't end. See, the assurance that we have of our salvation and the standing of the Father are rooted in what Jesus did. That is what it is. Not what we have done. Jesus became our high priest. It's a priesthood that was made perfect through his suffering and death on a cross. He was our representative. He is our representative before God. So why would we need another priest? Why do we need another representative when we have Jesus who is perfect? He didn't have to atone for his own sins first. He's the source of our salvation. This is, this is our high priest. This is Jesus. Now, are you still trying to do things on your own? Don't you see that Jesus is better? Do you see that he is better? Is there something else that you're putting above Jesus? Only Jesus is the source of our salvation. Remember what it said in verse 2. The high priest would deal gently with those that are wayward, those that are ignorant. Do you remember that verse? Jesus as our high priest does that too. He deals with us. He deals with us. So we're ignorant sometimes. We're, we're wayward. There are times when we do things our way. Times, many times when we don't obey. Times when we don't believe. Even times when we think we can save ourselves. But it says that Jesus deals gently, as our high priest deals gently with us. Aren't you glad that de Jesus deals gently with you? He doesn't have to. But as our high priest appointed and sent from his heavenly father, he does. We're wayward. We're ignorant. And Jesus deals with us. Last week, Sam ended off in this passage, and I just want to end off in this one too. Chapter 4, verses 15 to 16. I love what we read right here. So we have a high priest that knows what we're going through. That's important to know here too. He's not just a high priest that can't sympathize 
with us and our weaknesses and what we're struggling with. But we have a high priest who, who, who understands what we're going through because he was tempted in every way, yet was without sin. See, that way we can, we can draw near to him. And I love that Sam mentioned that at the very beginning of today, that we can draw near to him with confidence. We can confidently look to Jesus. Who are you looking to to save you? Who are you looking to for salvation? It only comes from Jesus. And his obedience is what secured salvation for us. Guys, this is why Jesus is better. This is why Jesus is the better high priest. This is why Jesus is the only priest that we need. What, what a glorious savior who's done this for us, who secured salvation for us. What a high priest, the best high priest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are just grateful for what you have done, for sending Jesus to us, for Jesus, this high priest, better than, than anything else, who's obtained salvation for us. And we confess that oftentimes we, we go wayward. We do our own thing. Heavenly Father, thank you that you were gentle with us and you call us and you keep calling us to yourself. Just remind us of that, to keep coming back to you, knowing that we can draw near to you with confidence because you are our great high priest. And we praise you and we thank you for that. Amen.